Hello and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Brian and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide for a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on May 15th, Fixing Sticky Tricky Problems in Family Tree with Catherine Grant, and that'll be on Friday at 4 p.m. If you'd like, like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Suzanne Hoffman, who will, giving, who will be giving a presentation on immigration and naturalization records from 1790 to 1945. And if Suzanne is ready, then we'll turn the time over to her. Okay, thank you, Bryant. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bryant Seda, Suzanne Hoffman, and I'm joining you from Chicago where I'm a professional forensic genealogist and a longtime volunteer at our local family history center. My background in immigration and naturalization comes from the fact that my longest standing immigrant came from Eastern Europe in the 1840s. So uh, in truth, to navigate my way through doing genealogy, I have to be an expert in naturalization and immigration. So with that, we're gonna move right in. Uh, let's look, take a look at the agenda that we're going to go through for the um, uh, presentation. We're going to talk about a history of naturalization, why naturalization was necessary, uh, some immigration statistics, changes to the laws and requirements, the types of files that are generated through our systems, and how to request those files. Now we're going to be doing a little bit of backwards and forwards here, um, but everything's based on time frames. Uh, we're going to talk about immigration in time frames. We're going to talk about naturalization in time frames. So my thanks to Marion Smith. Uh, she rec recently retired from the U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services, USCIS, after more than 30 years as the historian for the agency and its predecessor, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, INS. So Marion focused on the federalization of immigration policy during the 19th and 20th centuries, while championing access to records and records management. If you ever have a chance to hear her speak, don't hesitate. What we can glean from the federal records today is largely in part due to her efforts over the past 30 years. And I'm going to, this slide will be at the end as well, uh, but it's very clear when we're talking about INS records, Immigration Naturalization Service records, versus USCIS records. The USCIS didn't start until the mid 20th century. Those are all the records that we talked about, the C files, the A files, the AR2 files, registry files, all the new files that have been generated for immigrants coming in. All of our older records actually only go back to the very beginning of the 20th century uh, with immigration lists, the border manifests, the uh, shipping manifest, any correspondence, correspondence associated with that, um, and Prior to that, you've got customs lists, and we'll talk a little bit about what went on in the 18th and 19th century as a separate item. So in the history of naturalization, we're going to focus on um, some of the early laws, and then we'll talk about the transition as we go through. Um, we're going to go back and forth over the next few slides. We'll talk about immigration statistics but the also affecting naturalization acts and limitations imposed on immigration because of those statistics. So these dates are significant as the U.S. as a country defines who can naturalize. And as early as 1790, when the first census was taken, citizenship was not a right. It still must be granted and various courts were established to process applications after having lived in the United States for two consecutive years you couldn't legally own property or testify in court if you were not a citizen. So for the most part, anyone of British extraction was granted citizenship pre-revolutionary war. Post-war, there were three different types of citizenship leading up to 1790. 
There was the right of denization, which was used to obtain land, the oath of allegiance to renounce all foreign loyalties, and collective citizenship, which was granted to anyone living in the U.S. when it became a country in 1776. But remember, it all would have only been useful for a single generation. If you were born here, you were already a citizen. So in 1790, when they did the first census, it was any free whites of good moral character. They're already striating the population. Um, it actually didn't include blacks. It didn't include any um, uh, females either. In 1795, they added a five-year residency requirement. You had to declare your intent to naturalize, and you had three years in which you could petition to naturalize. In 1870, at the culmination of the Civil War, the edicts following African naturalizations first excluded Chinese and then other Asians. So we're sort of um, playing a game of, of, of chess, moving pieces back and forth. In 1906, we added knowledge of English and literacy. So that's just a very early um, idea of what was going on in naturalization. Well, what was driving that was, in fact, the immigration that was going on. So you had, pre-1790, about 300,000 Africans who'd come in, mostly as slaves, but there were free white, uh, free uh, uh, blacks that came in. English and various English-speaking countries generated about 300,000. Some of those were indentured servants, mostly religious um, exiles, few convicts thrown in for good measure. Um, Scotch-Irish, racially inferior to the British, supposedly. Germans, about 100,000. Uh, Scottish, 75,000. So a moment ago, while we were talking about naturalization or becoming a citizen, now we're looking at immigration and people who were barred. They were barred based on race, gender, servitude, moral character. Um, and we're going to use the same bands when we start talking about immigration services um, as we talk about the growth of population in immigration. So it doesn't include the population already in the United States when we're talking about these numbers, uh, nor does it include the Native Americans who are also denied citizenship. So in 1790 to 1802, which is the first band of um, citizenship and the naturalization, it's defined actually by the Naturalization Act of 1798. It was a political move to decrease the number of voters that voted against the Federalist Party. It caused a rush of naturalization by those who had already uh, fulfilled the five-year residency requirement, but who would be prevented from becoming citizens if the minimum wait time was raised. And it was, to 14 years. Um, it was almost immediately repealed before it had a chance to take effect. But you can see that there's a political, almost gerrymandering going on as well within the naturalization process. So, Everything up until 1790 was done by the individual states. The first federal activity didn't occur until 1790. Then in 1795, they repealed what they had done in 1790, raised the residency requirement from three to five years, um, and introduced that two-step process, that um, intent and then petition. The Naturalization Act of 1798 was much more politically motivated, and 1802, basically took out everything that had been put in in 1798. So um, it was an interesting time, I think, if you wanted to naturalize between 1790 and 1802. Uh, I don't think I could have figured it out. So the next band of uh, wave of immigration is 1790 to 1820 in terms of people coming in. And this gives us, again, the locations people were coming from. Notice it's all Western Europe. Uh, it is all um, uh, primarily English and, and, and probably the British Isles more than anything else. So the first census in 1790 had about 3.9 million with that large ethnic group being English, but there's also 20% with African heritage. So um, the, the population that was coming out of Africa that was both free and slave was a significant portion of our um, uh, heritage. So it's Thomas Paine who originally was British, but came to the United States. As he noted in 1790, after that first census was completed, he says the United States is becoming the asylum for the persecuted lovers of civil and religious liberty from every part of Europe. And in his pamphlet, Common Sense, he later noted that Europe, not England, was the parent country or countries of America. 
Uh, so in 1802 to 1901, which is a huge band, there was a lot of activity, a lot of things that happened, and a lot of economic conditions in Europe that impacted the actual migration into the United States. There was a Civil Rights Act of 1866. You can imagine that was right around the Civil War. The Naturalization Act of 1870, which affirmed the rights um, uh, to persons of African descent. The Page Act of 1875, which now imposed an immigration ban on Chinese women initially. And then in 1882, it was extended to Chinese men. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Homesteaders that got caught up in the naturalization process. You couldn't document your naturalization. You couldn't actually become a homesteader in owed land. That was, uh, we'll come into that later in a, um, talking about women and how women had ownership or couldn't. Uh, Civil War veterans could actually, the moment they signed up to fight in the Civil War, they could naturalize. Uh, Immigration Acts of 82 and 91 sent federal standards and processes in place. Um, it basically was setting us up for the transition from uh, going to um, a, a hodgepodge of, of federalization and notes and courts and things like that to a much more standardized uh, process and, and uh, solidification of the court systems. Uh, and then 1888 and 1891 allowed for deportation. So you could come over, they didn't like you, you could go back. Uh, and the Alien Contract Labor Law of 1885 which prevented importation of alien workforces. Notably, it was done after the Industrial Revolution when we needed those workforces. But the focus on China came about for a couple of reasons. Um, as we'll see in the next set of statistics, the Chinese were fleeing their country due to political unrest, poor economic conditions, and the lure of gold. In the 1850s, more than 40,000 Chinese immigrants came to California. They were willing to work for almost nothing, and that tipped the balance and drove down the cost of labor to a level of servitude that kept real wages below a poverty level. This continued while the cross-continental railroads were being built. So here's that industrialization coming up on top of the um, gold rush. The gold rush starts to die down, industrialization comes up, we move the workforce from one to the other. The railroads were being built in the 1860s. Single men were the first to arrive then soon followed were the single women. This created a challenge with camp followers and prostitution, which was quickly squelched by eliminating the right of a single Chinese woman to emigrate to the US. In 1882, when the need for cheap labor expired, the act of 1882 was extended to Chinese men as well. These were the first laws imposed on an ethnic group, immigration, and foreshadowed the 1924 Natural Origins Act. So 1882 also imposed taxes, set up a screening process to exclude idiots, lunatics, convicts, or likely public charges. And you will see that all through the late 1800s when you're looking at the um, manifest, you'll see LPC in those who were detained. That means a likely public charge, which focused on children who are um, traveling alone, women traveling alone or just with children who had no visible means of support. So then another band of immigration we look at is 1820 to 1880. And again, that's that broad expanse um, where we had all kinds of um, uh, challenges in Europe. So you see a huge amount, I mean, 3 million people now coming from the German empire and the Austro-Hungarian empire is a whole nother thousand, um, 4,000 coming out of Ireland and Britain, and uh, about a uh, thousand, uh, excuse me, a hundred uh, million coming out of Canada and China uh, and then Africa. So drawing on the conclusion of Thomas Paine, who had then emigrated to the United States and died in 1809, political strife and foreign wars were actually fueling the emigration to the United States. It was nice that everybody, it was the land of opportunity in terms of ownership of land and potentially gold, those were two instances to come over, but predominantly it was political strife and foreign wars. And the German Empire and consequently the Austro-Hungarian Empire were embroiled in a revolution in the late 1840s. And German unification between 1864 and about 1871, compounded with the British and the Irish embroiled in their own struggle of home rule and everybody had crop failures. You had the Irish potato famine, you had deteriorating 
economic conditions throughout Western Europe. So there's a, a mass um, departure from Europe. I mean, there are statistics that come out of other countries. Uh, you hear uh, statistics coming out of Sweden that say almost a third of the entire population of Sweden left the country during these poor economic conditions to come to the United States. Uh, so it, there's some fascinating history on where people came and why they came. But uh, for the most part, they did come to get away from foreign wars and political strife. So I'm going to explain this a little bit. This is actually a, uh, a wonderful chart, but it comes at you with uh, multiple axes. And it happens to be from my old company, Tableau, um, that this was created in. So this is the Migration Policy Institute uh, creating tabular data. Now, the term immigrants, which you can also think of as foreign born, refers to people residing in the U.S. who are not U.S. citizens at birth. So the, this population includes naturalized citizens, lawful permanent residents, certain legal non-immigrants, uh, people on work visas or students, those admit admitted under refugee or asylum status, and persons illegally um, residing in the US. So to read this table properly, the orange line is read against the left-hand vertical axis as a percentage of the population. And the blue line is the actual number of immigrants, which, it, which becomes just over 45 million in 2020. So recent facts from the USCIS indicate that just under half of the total number of immigrants have been naturalized, or in other words, granted citizenship so that they can vote. Um, so hopefully that uh, gives you a, a pretty good image of, of where we've come from, the percentage of our population, but just the overall number of immigrants as people came in. Um, so again, uh, think of the, it's an empirical number on the blue line on the right hand axis and a percentage on the left hand uh, axis and the years of course underneath. So the next banding is 1891 to 1906. 1892, of course, is the opening of Ellis Island. It's creation of bureaucratic offices to manage and coordinate all immigrant enforcement. There's an entire department set up that just manages this. There's medical exclusion of some Im in immigrants. Uh, the Naturalization Act of 1906, which was sort of a watershed year, and that learning English was required for naturalization. Uh, we had previously had literacy, and, but it didn't have to necessarily be English, but now you had to have some literacy um, in just being able to communicate in, at a very low level within English as well. Um, and it made very, uh, uh, quite a few changes to the Naturalization Act of 1870. So we're back to that timeline, and, and 1892, of course, is watershed because of the opening of Ellis Island. Um, we made a complete transition to a federal function. Everything's regulated, and it's now all under INS, Immigration and Naturalization um, Services. 1790 to 1906, in total, so as a genealogist, I'm interested of the broader scope of issues of how do you become a citizen? What's the process you go through? You can file your first papers or intend to naturalize as soon as you uh, local residents. And then the waiting period for the petition or second papers. That's what changed over the course of time. So up until 1906, 5,000 federal, state, or local courts had the authority to grant citizenship. Chancery courts, probate courts, criminal courts, juvenile courts, anything. You can, you find these papers, whatever court was closest or had the shortest line, I guess, that's where people went. You need to search the records of all the courts covering an area to make sure you, you've exhausted your search, reasonably exhaustive search uh, as part of our um, BCG standards. You could file your declaration of intent in one court in one state and file the petition several years later in another court in state. You've got to keep that in mind as well. Five-year residency requirement in the U.S., one year in the local jurisdiction for the petition. Uh, just to give you guidelines, not all these declarations and petitions are digitized and online. Many of them are still in microfilm form. So that's a reason to make sure you go to the library, go to the Family History Center, um, because they may in, in fact have those microfilms that you need to find this information out. 
So back to immigration, between 1820 and 1860, 5.4 million people arrived in the US out of that 45 million we were talking about. While four fifths came through New York, there were 70 other um, assigned federal immigration stations along the shoreline in the, in the uh, uh, East Coast and, and South and 200 points of potential disembarkation. So while they said there were 70 immigration stations, those other you know, 130 that are points of potential disembarkation, actually um, their records resided at the federal immigration stations, but they were also points of, of departure. So there's a lot of ports you can look at. Everyone thinks New York. Well, 20% didn't come in through New York, so you gotta find out where those people came in. Um, Immigrants often left their immigration ports without consideration of where they were going to. Think about it. There were far more places to go in the United States than there were to leave from in Europe, interestingly enough. So when you make it to a port in Europe and you're on your way out, what boat's leaving next? I don't care where it's going. Was sometimes I think the um, overarching decision making as to what boat or what ship they got on. Um, sometimes they made pretty circuitous trips also to get to those uh, points. I followed one relative that literally went east to be able to go west. Um, and remember, more than seven, since 1790, more than 45 million people have arrived. So it's noteworthy that the, there were brokers who dealt in European immigration. There were salesmen who traveled the countryside as representatives of the shipping companies from both passenger and merchant ships banks sold tickets, relatives sent tickets from the U.S. to their homeland. It's a whole variety of ways to get from the sailing point to the U.S. So the hard part was getting to the sailing point. There, are, um, there aren't that many options. We, we didn't have a, uh, a well-formulated railway system. Um, it, people were on foot. Uh, they you know, it, it didn't know what ports, they didn't know what was between them and the port. Many of these people had never been out of their town. Uh, if you're um, in Eastern Europe, you've never been out of the Gerbania, which is, you know, like the county. So this was a major upheaval to actually get to the departure point of the ship. And then everybody was examined before they got on the ship. The manifests for those ships were created in, before the uh, point of departure. So you got to the point of departure, you paid the money, you had to show your travel documents, you had to be put onto the manifest. Because when you got to the United States, that manifest was offered to the immigration officers, and that's what they did all their research from. So we all know it's a myth. People's names were changed. They were mispronounced. When you landed in the United States, you generally had someone who spoke your language as an interpreter helping you at Ellis Island or one of those other 70 immigration points, and they had the manifest of the ship that had been written before you departed that had all your information. And they all they were doing is making sure that you were the person that was um, coming into the country. So um, many immigrants traveled on ships that took extra cargo if there were room without the benefit of hospitable accommodations. Those transatlantic passenger ships that we think of, luxury liners, things like that, they were way too costly for most steerage class passengers. So most of the ships that people came on were pretty rudimentary. They, they, there wasn't a very uh, luxuri luxurious bent to them. So this over time shows you how many people actually immigrated. It's another view. Um, you can see the annual growth by year. Before 1880, again, it was more mostly Northern and Western Europe. 1880 to 1915, you started to see Eastern Europe and Southern Europe pouring in. 1970 to today, you've got mostly Asian, Latin American, which includes Mexico. So anyone want to guess why the spike in 1988? Well, Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, in which roughly 2.7 million undocumented foreign U.S. citizens obtained legal immigration status under the amnesty program. So that explains that spike out towards the end. So initially 20th century immigration had been curtailed to reflect a population that existed before the turn of the century. So the Emergency Quota Act of 1921 
established quotas originally based on the 1910 census, but then they backdated it to the 1890 census. Well, this was largely a European-based population and much more reflective of the political and ecological climate um, than it was based on economic or social hostilities. It's sort of disheartening to note that the census upon which this is based is the one census that was burned and of great misfortune to those of us genealogists who really need to be researching later 19th century immigration. My theory is that there was something in that 1890 census that lawmakers did not want to have be publicly known. The fire, as it were, was in the Commerce Building in 1921. Most of the census that had been inexpertly kept on shelves in the open, in the basis of the basement of the building in which the fire started, um, which was for the most part flooded, not burned out. A large portion of the census questions on the 1890 census dealt with race, origins, and origination. Um, we're gonna hear more about that when I talk about the 1924 Act. But basically in the 20th century, immigration is turned into a limitation of who you know and lottery systems. A random person trying to immigrate into the US will have a hard time unless they fit into a profile as a refugee, one needing political assignment, asylum or you already have a family that's here. Now I want you to note a couple of other things. In 1907, no persons with physical or mental defects, no one under 16 without parentage. There was a lot of lying going on. 1917, no homosexuals, and that was not removed until 1990. Immigration Act of 1924, banning all Asians. Immigration shut down during the depression, including rep repatriation and deportations. And then the Na Nationality Act of 1952 finally brought quotas back into the 20th century, and we were using the 1920, uh, 1920 census as our uh, benchmark. And then in 1965, they abolished all natural origin quotas. So here's a little bit more in depth on 1924 Origins Act. Um, this slide, the one next to it is talking about the 1924 Immigrations Act it's because they've got some unusual quirks. It basically set apart those seeking to immigrate with no familial ties to the US from those who already had family here, with the exception of farmers who wanted farmers. And the reference to the 1890 census, which we know burned to 1921, six years before this rule. The controversy over the fire still remains today. Um, this had been a very unique census, as I said, and there have been countless lawsuits filed against the government for that information that was collected. There were, actually was not one fire, but there were two targeting this huge collection of papers. And it turns out the majority of the documents could have been salvaged. The primary damage was water, not fire. There were some that were singed around the edges, but for the most part, they expected that almost 75% of what they eventually trashed could have been saved. The rest, they were thrown away between 1933 and 1935. So they literally sat in their burned and waterlogged condition from 1921 to 1933 with being improperly stored and no one doing any kind of restorative work on the documents. So the key to this is, if you look at what happens in the Natural Origins Act, what we're actually doing is getting away from who are you, where you're coming from, to total populations as a nationality, um, and then establishing quotas based on birth or ancestry as of the total population in the US. In other words, we're gonna mirror the population that already exists here and establish quotas based on that population. And that's why this 1890 census had been so critical because up until 20, 1927, that's the one they were using um, and we didn't have access to it. Then they repealed it. <laughs> so the Hart Seller Act abolished the natural origins quota system that they had established and replacing it with a preference system that focused on skills and family relationships. So this is why I say that really to get the ability to come into the United States now, it's who you know and what you do. Um, there's numerical restrictions on visas. They're set at 170,000 per year, and it doesn't include the immediate relatives of US um, citizens, nor special immigrants, which those are the independent nations 
um, where we've got um, former citizens, ministers, employees of the U.S. government abroad, um, people seeking asylum, things like that. Uh, but we're in, we're still under this uh, Reunification Act of 1965. So some of the things that came into play in the early 20th century were, as they were changing the laws, they created a few anecdotal um, uh, occurrences that from 1907 to 1922, you could actually lose your citizenship, even if you were born in the United States. So loss could account for lack of. Um, you could not get on a board ship for which there was no quota available. So the departing um, ports knew what quota was available. They knew what quota each ship had. You reached that number, that was it. So for one young mother-to-be who unfortunately gave birth crossing the um, Atlantic Ocean, her unborn child didn't need a quota slot but her new infant did. Uh, the mother was detained under the fact that there was no room for her child in the uh, immigration quota. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, there was a gracious INS officer who said, you know, crazy, this is a happy occurrence, not one worthy of sending the mother and child back to the country of origin, and they made an exception. Um, but they, the mother and the child were actually detained for an entire day before the situation was resolved. Uh, and you see that where you have people that are women that are applying for citizenship um, after 1922 because they had ostensibly lost their citizenship between 1907 and 1922. Their husbands died, their husbands divorced them, um, whatever reason, and, and they actually then had to go reapply. Uh, and you'll see a notation on the um, documents, the petition, that actually says, you know, previous citizenship or, or something like that. Um, now, a woman who was living abroad could correct the problem by returning to the U.S. to regain her citizenship. But again, not if she exceeded the quota of her newly acquired um, nationality. You had a lot of people who at that point in time thought um, between the, you know, right, right in that um, sort of a, a, a very high prosperous time um, just after World War I, you had people going to Germany, you had people going to France and Britain. They'd go there for the summer, they'd go there to live, and they'd go outside of their citizenship, and they actually had to uh, reapply. That was not fun for them. Uh, 1906, again, to talk about why that's such a watershed year, that was the formation of INS, um, and that, again, federalization of the, the process through which you went. Um, for, for coming in and, and gain, gaining citizenship. USCIS, in terms of governance, was created under the Homeland Security Act in 2003. And we're under USCIS, as most people know today. So the original, to just give you an overview of women, the original verbiage in the um, 1790 uh, Naturalization Act excluded free white, um, excluded women, excluded um, anybody with African descent, uh, it declared free white persons, but I, I guess women weren't persons because it really didn't want um, women there. From 1855 uh, to 1922, women had derivative citizenship. In other words, they gained whatever citizenship their husband had, um, regardless of whether they were born in the United States or not. Female homesteaders, um, if they didn't have naturalization or they got caught up in that derivative citizenship, had to apply for new citizenship because you had to show um, citizenship to be able to homestead. Uh, and between 1907 and 1922, as I said, they could um, lose their citizenship and be declared an alien. Now, by 1936, when uh, Social Security came in, you see a whole flurry of people becoming naturalized because they want to take advantage of Social Security. So um, we track alien status in the uh, forms that, that are generated in the system, but you really did have the ability um, to remain an alien and not uh, become a naturalized citizen unless you really want Social Security, then you absolutely had to. So how, what was the process? I talked about two steps to the process. First papers is, is the intent to naturalize. Um, alien renounces all allegiance to their homeland, declares their intent to become a U.S. citizen, and there's basically no waiting period for this paperwork. I have a relative who 
uh, came to the United States in 1909. He filed his in, um, intent to naturalize in 1910, and that was it. In 1912, I have a picture of him in the Russian army. So clearly, he didn't stay and he went home. Uh, but um, you know, he he came here and he immediately said, "No, I'm going to be a citizen." And then something happened. I'm still trying to find out what. Um, second papers, the petition to naturalize, depending on when you came in, it's either three years or five years, but it has to be within seven years of those first papers uh, being filed. Um, it was not required prior to 1903 in some courts. You could just go in and petition to naturalize. You didn't. Er, um, it was your intent to naturalize all combined into one form. Uh, when they filed is critical for what information is included. Thankful, be thankful if you have family that came in after 1929, there's a photo included. That's what everybody hopes for. After 1906, you have your family members, you have a lot more information on the family origins. And if you did decide to change your name, because this is a legal document, you could do it right on the form. So you have a lot of people who came over who Americanized their names and you'll see the name on the bottom of the form um, right underneath where it says what ship they came over on, what name was on the manifest, and the AKA um, is the name that they're uh, naturalizing under, which is their formal name change, and there was no other documentation that was needed um, for that name change at that time. Um, types of files that exist in the um, uh, in uh, NARA, whether you're going up to College Park or you're going to Washington, D.C., or you're going to your local um, um, office of, of records, um, you've got a cert uh, certificate file, which is a C file. It has all of the federal records relating to naturalization in any court. Um, it replaces um, the old naturalization certificates. Um, now, the, and that prompts the certificate of citizenship for derivative or repatriation or resumption files. The A files are the alien files. Those are the immigrant files that um, for everybody, uh, actually after April 1st, 1944, anybody in the country had to file an A file if they hadn't already filed for naturalization. Um, and we're gonna see that picture again that I showed you from Marion Smith in a moment. Um, other types of files, those registry files are records which document the creation of the immigrant, immigrants' arrival records um, for anyone between uh, 1924 and for whom no arrival record could later be found. So I have a, a relative where, um, you know, we, we absolutely, we see no um, information, but we've got his naturalization certificate, but we have no immigration information. We have no other um, files that appear to be formed. He has a registry file because of that. Then the alien registration form, that AR2, Again, those are the 5.5 million um, people who are still here that have not um, become naturalized. And they're primarily from people who came in during uh, uh, the early days of World War II. So there's our document again that we can look at. So the custom lists um, that are, let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, there we are. Our custom lists, um, 1820 to 1892, are all the records that were done um, under custom houses. They're all local records. They're not federal in any way, shape, or form, uh, but they're all done uh, by um, the shipping companies, the, the state um, courts, the clerks in the area. And then from 1890 to uh, and up, you've got your immigration lists, your border arrival manifest, your correspondence, um, and then any naturalization correspondence that comes in. That's all part of INS, and that's what you can find at your um, uh, local naturalization, where your local re naturalization records are, are held. For aliens and other um, INS records that are under USCIS, it's visa files. Um, any of the registry files for the incomplete files, those alien registration two files, any of the A files that were filed since 1944, um, any of your certificate files and A files um, that are not specific to World War II but are after that. So there's a clear definition of based on 
when you were in fact naturalized or when you immigrated, where those records are going to be held. Now we all want them to be held at Family Search and, and Ancestry and My Heritage um, and Find My Past and Heritage Quest, and they all are. And I will tell you that some registries, some uh, manifests are in different conditions depending on who filmed them and when they were filmed. So, you know, exhaustive search, I always say if you can't find someone in one location, go to another um, because it could very well be in another location. So how do you do it? How do you research it? How do you figure out where you're going? Um, within USCIS, they have a genealogical section, genealogy.uscis.dhs.gov, and it's a fee-for-service program that provides researchers with a way to figure out where they're gonna, how they're gonna get the records. So do you have a file number? That's the best thing to have, whether you have a certificate file number or you have a petition file number. Yes, you can go right through to the process requested by the record locator. If you don't have it, you're gonna have to go through an index search. Now, sometimes you can't get the actual certificate online. Um, what they digitized was only the index card, but that index card should have a C file or a P file number that allows you to then go back and start your access again. And remember, not all of those records have been digitized in systems. Some of them are still on microfilm. I know I was at a family history center and I just pulled um, a couple of uh, intent to naturalize uh, declarations, as it were, first papers um, that had never been digitized. Um, so I was very happy to see those. The unfortunate part was they were very early in the system, so I had very little information, uh, which is another challenge that, that you can have. So this is an example of what a declaration of intent, an old one, which is the one on the front, versus underneath, which is a new one from after 1929 that actually has the picture on it. So there's very different bits of information that you're going to get. Now you see um, you know, where the person was born in, um, when they left, um, what town, but you don't have any of the family information uh, that's with that top one. So, and it's the luck of the draw. It just depends on when your uh, relatives came in or, or the, the, excuse me, the people you're searching came in for you to be able to figure out um, where they actually were coming from. And here's the, uh, an actual certificate. So this is my great grandfather. There are no numbers of any kind on this document. If we didn't have it in our personal possession, we wouldn't know what we were looking for or how to find it. And you see a lot of stamps that look like postage stamps all, all over the top of it. Uh, this gentleman's kids, about three out of the seven that he had, moved to Canada. And this document was used by every single one of them over the course of the um, time that it was held. And if I can point these out, here's a stamp, there's a stamp. This one says it's for Morris, says son Morris L. Uh, this one says Francis P. This one says son George C. Um, so they, they are all stamps for when they went through. But it's an amazing document. Unfortunately, it's not in my hands, it's in someone else's. Uh, but that shows you what they can actually look like, as opposed to these, which are the very pleasant looking certificates. If you have these, these are like gold, and these will have a C number on all of them. Okay, that's actually all I have. I'd love to entertain questions at this point. Thank you so much, Suzanne. If there's any questions from the audience, then please post them in the chat box and Suzanne can answer them for us. It looks like our first question is from Courtney and it says, what do you know about Italians who immigrated? Well, there weren't any special rules for immigrating from any particular location. I mean, the bulk of Italians came in when I mentioned that the Southern Europeans came in that primarily was Italians that came in at about the same time the Eastern Europeans started to flow in between 1840 and 1890. Uh, again, it wasn't good economic conditions and a lot of them came in, a good portion of them settled in Boston and New York, New York obviously, um, but they, and then they came in in large families. And 
I think that the Italians coming in, the Eastern European coming in, and some of the, the more isolated areas, they were all part of that 1890 census that they, they wanted to sort of just give a baseline for this is what we're going to have coming in because there would have been a lot more coming in from those countries because they were economically um, deprived um, regions and they, they wanted to come in on mass, sort of like what I said about Sweden where the up with the 30%. Uh, but there's, um, I mean, little Italy and New York still very vibrant community today. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people have um, history back through Italy um, coming in in the mid 18, 1800s. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And our next question is from Joe and it says, are there advantages to corresponding to obtain original copies of naturalization records versus researching the same records in digital or microfilm copies? So it depends on whether the actual digitization that you're looking at is a full record. The files are voluminous. Um, what you miss in, in just looking at a digitization or a microfilm image is all you're seeing is the document. Typically, there's a huge file behind that that has a lot of more information about the immigrant as they're coming over. If you um, can picture uh, all the immigration officers standing there, they're not only recording what's on the manifest, they're also recording the answers to the questions that are being asked of the immigrant and the family members coming in. And all that documentation stayed with the file. So especially if they were detained for any reason or um, uh, you know, they didn't become naturalized or they took time to become naturalized, there's a file. So you really want that underlying documentation and be worth the request. Now, I'll add one more piece, the unfortunate, um, challenge that we're in right now is the uh, there's a proposal to raise the fees. Uh, typically getting records from uh, NARA, um, College Park, uh, used to be a baseline of $65 to actually get the uh, paper copies of the naturalization documents. And it would vary depending on what files they needed, whether they were going into alien registration files or into naturalization correspondence, um, it might cost anywhere from the 65 to, you know, 150, $180. Right now, they're talking about making the baseline such that it would cost upwards of five and $600 for any file that's requested. So the baseline would be for just the paper copy of almost $300. And then for the correspondence, it would be on top of that. So there's a petition that was sent around in the, in the end of 2019 trying to prevent that from happening because it basically is dinging all of the uh, genealogists around the world. I haven't heard in the COVID-19 um, debacle, I haven't heard what they've done with that, but it would be disastrous to raise the um, rate for these uh, papers. So if you have an interest in getting a hold of documents, I'd do it now before they figure out what they're going to be charging people for the future. Perfect. And follow-up question. Is that file only found in federally managed naturalizations or are there also case files in the various courts prior to 1906? Um, there aren't. Um, so they've got all the case files that were in the um, state. If they were part of um, the, the uh, naturalization process, have been ferried into the federal files. They've been, uh, the only thing that's available in the state is the actual image of the um, documents that were retained. They, did, they really didn't um, maintain any of the notes um, that had been in the files. Perfect, thank you. And if there's any other questions from the audience, um, please post them in the chat box. And it looks like we have one more question from Joe. Do you have tips for navigating the online naturalization records? They're organized somewhat oddly, especially on Ancestry. Yeah, they are. Uh, I tell you, here's my trick for doing it. You never go in with the name of your immigrant 
and try and find the records. What I try to do is find the court that they're associated with. So if they're, um, they were in circuit court in Chicago, I would go into the circuit court files and then research my individual. Um, if it's post-1906 and you're only dealing with the federal records, uh, sometimes it's a little bit harder. Um, SteveMorse.org is a perfect place to go because it gives you a lot more uh, ways to define who you're going to be looking for, especially if you don't know the spelling of the individual and the names. It, they've got a better um, indexing um, system so that it can uh, locate based on Soundex. Uh, it, it's, it's an easier way. You can actually look at all the different locales um, that you might have um, come into, all the ports, or you could look at specific ports. So you can do it by geography. Uh, you can do it by time frame. You can do it by ship's name. Uh, there's a, a, a myriad of breakdowns that makes it much easier to do it than Ancestry. Um, but I agree, they've, it was, um, what's a good way to put it? Um, it? It was spontaneous in terms of how they managed to put those files together and they don't quite make good physical sense if you wanna do searching. That's not what they were originally were digitized for. So I think they were just for um, permanent storage. And now, of course, we want access to them. So we need a better way. stevemorse.org, that would be my choice. Thank you, Suzanne. You're welcome. Okay, if there's no more questions, then thank you so much uh, once again, Suzanne, for presenting. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us as well. Um, we'd like to remind you about our webinar coming up next week on May 15th, Fixing Sticky Tricky Problems in Family Tree with Catherine Grant. And that'll be Friday at 4 p.m. So we hope you join us for that and have a great day.